Now, as we come to Zechariah, here's a prophet that we want to get acquainted with, know something about his background. His name means whom Jehovah remembers. And he's identified here as the son of Berechiah. And Berechiah is the son of Iddo, the prophet. And so, actually, Zechariah, the name means Jehovah remembers. And Berechiah means Jehovah blesses. And Iddo means the appointed time. And these cluster names are quite interesting, by the way, because actually God remembers to bless at the appointed time. And that, I think, is something we ought to pick up here in this first verse. Now, this cluster of names with such rich meanings is suggestive of the encouragement that God wanted to give to the remnant that had returned to Jerusalem. In other words, God remembers and blesses in the appointed time. And we've seen that in the prophecy of Haggai. Now, the Jewish Targum states that Zechariah was slain in the sanctuary and that this Zechariah was both prophet and priest. And in Nehemiah 12, 4, Iddo is mentioned as one of the heads of a priestly family. And Josephus states that Zechariah, the son of Baruchus, was slain at the temple. There are those who identify Zechariah here, by the way, as the one mentioned by the Lord Jesus in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. Probably we ought to turn to that in 2335, where he says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. So that apparently... This is the man that we're dealing with here. But there are in Scripture about 20, I think it's 25 men, separate men by the name of Zechariah that's mentioned. In fact, somewhere between 25 and 30 Zacharias are mentioned in the Scripture. Now, there is one that's mentioned that I'd like to call attention to, one other one, and he's the one who actually opens the New Testament. And it's quite interesting, this Zechariah just about closes the Old Testament next to the last book, and the New Testament actually opens with Luke's account. And it's the account of Zechariah, a priest who was serving at the altar of incense when the angel appeared to him and his wife was named Elizabeth, so that, again, God remembered. And after 400 years of silence, he broke through. Why? Because God remembered. And Zechariah is the first one that is appeared to. So that makes Zechariah quite an important individual here for us to look at. Now, we've already mentioned this before. Zechariah was contemporary with Haggai although he was younger than Haggai. And you say, how do you know? Well, the way that we know is in Zechariah 2, 4, it says, And said unto him, Run, speak to this young man. And this young man was Zechariah. So I take it that Haggai is a much older man than that. But this book, actually, that he wrote, it has the characteristics of an apocalypse. The visions resemble those in the book of Daniel and Revelation. And here is some facts that are quite interesting to note. Daniel was born in the land of Israel, but he wrote his apocalypse outside of the land of Israel, down at Babylon. Now, Zechariah was born outside the land, probably down by the canals of Babylon, but he wrote his within the land. Now, Daniel and Ezekiel and John all wrote outside the land, and they all wrote books that are like an apocalypse. 
Only Zechariah was in Israel when he wrote his apocalypse. In other words, in the dark day of discouragement which blanketed the remnant, he saw the glory in all of the rapture and vision of hope. He has more messianic prophecies than any of the other minor prophets. Now, I have an outline of this book that I think probably I ought to give you before we plunge into it. We have in the first six chapters apocalyptic visions, and they're messianic and millennial, and there are ten of those visions. And he had all of those visions given to him in one night. And I would say that that's a good night's work, by the way, to have that many visions. And then you have in this book a historic interlude, chapters 7 and 8. And in that, it resembles Isaiah. And there you have the same thing we have in Haggai. That was a question is asked, a question concerning a religious ritual. And the ritual was fasting. What about fasting? Is there any value to it? Well, we're going to see that in chapters 7 and 8. And then the last part, the third division, are prophetic burdens. That means prophecies of judgment. And that's from chapters 9 through 14. And you have in the first burden the prophetic aspects that are connected with the first coming of Christ, and that's in chapters 9 and 11, and the second burden of prophetic aspects connected with the second coming of Christ, chapters 12 through 14. So you can see that we have here a rather unusual book. Now, this book is in direct contrast to Haggai. He's contemporary with Haggai, They definitely knew each other, prophesied to the same people at the same period of time. And yet their prophecies are just about as different as any two could be. They are literally ages apart, but they were given to the same people at the same time. Haggai is down there at the foundation of the temple measuring it. He's really got his feet on the ground. But this young man, Zechariah, he's got his head in the air. And I tell you, when you have ten visions in one night, you've done pretty well. And his is entirely visionary, whereas Haggai is entirely practical. And yet they both are speaking for God to the same people at the same time concerning the same problem. And he'll speak to us today as Haggai spoke to us but in a different manner altogether. We need to recognize that these two need to go together. We suggested that in Haggai. You need the practical, pragmatic man to go along with the man who's visionary because there's a danger of the dreamer, you know, never being practical. And the practical man needs a vision also. So when you put these two together, you have a Happy combination, by the way. I heard the story of a native in Africa who was blind, and he met a fellow who had no legs. And so he put the fellow who had no legs on his shoulder. And the fellow that had no legs was the eyes for the fellow that had no eyes. And that's the way that they got along. One did the seeing, while the other one did the walking or whatever was needed to be, maybe running at times. You have that happy combination here in Haggai and Zechariah. Now we have, in verse 1, the introduction. And will you note that for just a moment? We have here the introduction and the message of warning that's in the first six verses. But the introduction we have in verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying. Now, the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, and again we have this geared to Gentile king, 
because there's no king in either Israel or Judah now. Lion of David is off the throne, and the times of the Gentiles have begun. Now, this second year is the same year that Haggai prophesied. It was in the sixth month of the second year of Darius that this man Haggai began. So, this is the year 520, and he began to prophesy, but it's the eighth month, and that's the month that Haggai missed. Haggai had a prophecy in September and in October and December, but none in November. So this man, Zechariah, he prophesies here in the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, and that is in November that he was given this prophecy. And that, of course, lets us know that he was contemporary with Haggai. Now, again, he uses an expression that Haggai used, the word of the Lord. In other words, he speaks by the same authority as Haggai does. And this phrase, by the way, occurs 14 times in this book, another book that has a great emphasis upon it. Since it has 14 chapters, then it would occur average once a chapter. Now let me read verse 2. The Lord hath been sorely displeased with your father. Now, this man speaking by the same authority that Haggai did, that is, that it's the word of the Lord, he's speaking now to the return remnant, and he's warning them not to follow in the footsteps of their pre-captivity fathers. He says, now, the reason that you went in captivity was because the Lord was displeased with your fathers. They sinned against God. Now, we don't want you to make that same blunder, that same mistake. Now, he goes on in verse 3. He says, Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. Well, here we go. He says here, Thus saith the Lord. But you notice how he's addressed. He's addressed as the Lord of hosts. Now, that has become a cliché to us today. In fact, many of the titles that are given to God have become almost meaningless to us, yet we use them a great deal. Now, what does Lord of hosts really mean? Well, it occurs 52 times in this book. It's very important, therefore. Now, the word host is the Hebrew sabah or sabaoth, and it means service our strength, or even warfare. And the way it's used here, it implies the boundless resources at his command for his people's good. That's Dr. Fawcett's definition of it. And I can't improve on it, so I use it. Let me say that again. The Lord of hosts means it implies the boundless resources at his command for his people's good. As we have it today, Paul says that he's rich in mercy and he has all power. So what do you need today, friends? A little mercy? Well, he's got an abundance of it. He's rich in it. And he can extend mercy to you. My, how we need it today. And he's the Lord of hosts. Now, will you notice? He says here, Therefore, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, that occurs here three times, you see, in this one verse. And then it occurs again in the next verse. Now, notice what he's saying to them here in verse 4. He says, Be not as your fathers unto whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and from your evil doings, but they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. This is his warning to them. Now, this starts off very practical, does it not? And it is very practical. He's saying here to them, he says, Your father." 
they wouldn't pay attention to the prophets. I sent to them, oh, I sent Hosea, I sent Joel, I sent Amos, and I sent to them Isaiah, I sent Jeremiah, I sent all of these prophets, and they didn't listen to them. They didn't heed them at all. And that's the reason that they went into captivity. Be not as your fathers, under whom the former prophets have cried, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn now from your evil ways and from your evil doings. But they did not hear, nor hearken unto me, saith the Lord. Now, he asks a question, verse 5. Will you notice this? He says, Your fathers, where are they? Well, and the prophets... Do they live forever? The prophets' voices are no longer sounded. That is the former prophet. Jeremiah and Isaiah and Hosea and Joel and Amos, they're gone. They're dead. Their voices are silent. And then, by the way, where are your fathers? Well, they're buried down yonder in Babylon. And that was the wrong place to be buried. You see, they wanted to be buried in that land. That was very important. Even old Jacob, down yonder in the land of Egypt, he made Joseph take an oath, says, don't you bury me here in Egypt. I want to be taken back up yonder and buried with my fathers. And that's where he's buried today, there at Hebron. And what's he waiting for? He's waiting for the day when God's going to raise him up along with the other patriarchs and the godly Israelites to live in that land. That's their hope. That was their hope, to be raised up, to be buried in that land. And therefore, they wanted to be buried in that land. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know before the eastern gate there, down through the valley of Kidron and all up on the side of the Mount of Olives, They're buried there, Israelites. Those are the graves that the Arabs mutilated a great deal. They are being restored by Israel. But why are they buried there? Because right there they expect to see the Messiah come someday to the earth. And I personally think they'll be raised from the dead when he returns to the earth to establish his kingdom. At the rapture, the Lord Jesus does not come to the earth. He comes into the air and he calls his church out of the world. He's not coming to the earth at that time to establish his kingdom. The world is to go through the great tribulation period. The church is to be removed. Now, there would be no point in raising these from the dead that are the Old Testament saints, both Jew and Gentile, because they just have to stand around and wait till the tribulation is over, to be raised to enter into the kingdom. And that is the thing. And may I say, this was a very pertinent question that Zechariah is asking. He says, your fathers, where are they? Are they buried way down yonder in Babylon? By the canals of Babylon? That's a bad place to be when your hope is right here in that land. You see, this meant a great deal in that day. This is a warning he gives them. But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not take hold of your fathers? Or, in other words, did they not overtake your fathers? The judgment came. In other words, your sins have overtaken you. And they returned and said, as the Lord of hosts thought to do unto us, According to our ways and according to our doings, so hath he dealt with us. In other words, they were finally willing to admit that that which had come to them by way of judgment was just and righteous on the part of God because he warned them they had not listened to them. Now, friends, we have come in Zechariah past the very practical section And I'd say it's the only practical section. And when I say that, I don't mean that what we're coming to is impractical. I just simply mean that we're now going to take up the visions that this man had. 
And we come now to the seventh verse, and there begins with verse 7, ten visions. And he had all of these in one night. Now, I recognize that most expositors say there are eight visions here, and I classify them as ten visions, and you'll see why when we come to the place where we make a division where the expositors, for the most part, and commentators just simply do not make the division. We're not trying to say they are wrong and we are right. We're just trying to say it's just a little different approach to this. Now, you may get the impression here that because he had these visions at night that they were dreams. But you will notice that he makes it very clear that is not quite it. I think probably I should read beginning at verse 7 now and read two verses. He says, "...upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month." Now, the Hebrew day, as you know, does not begin at January. And so this would be the eleventh month, and it would be February. And this was given February the 24th, 520 B.C., and we're going to see the significance of that in just a few moments. He says, "...upon the four and twentieth day of the eleventh month, which is the month Shebat, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were there red horses, that is, sorrel-colored horses, and white. Now, I want to look at these two verses because they're rather significant and rather important. I said that just because he had these visions at night, doesn't mean that they were dreams, because they were not. He says, I saw by night. He didn't say, I dreamed by night, but I saw in the night, that is, during the night season. And actually, the word behold is sort of like look or behold, as we have it here. And frankly, I think the translators should have put an exclamation point after, behold, it would be like this, look, there's a man, and the man is riding upon a red horse. Now, that's important for us to note here. It's not a dream that he had. Now, so many people differ with me about whether God speaks through dreams today or by visions, they like to say to me, and I've never attempted to correct any of them because I just let them go on in this connection. They say, I saw a vision last night. I say, well, how did you see it? Well, they say, I had a dream. And then I know immediately that it wasn't God giving them a message, but it was something they ate for dinner that evening that caused it to come to pass or some experience that they had had that came out in the dream when the mind is, shall I say, unlatched. When it's released, it's unlocked. And it generally wanders back over something that produces the dream. So that today I think that we cannot say that God speaks in dreams. Just because he spoke to this man at night, he says, I saw. I didn't dream. I saw. And I think we need to be very careful about noting these things because it's important to understand clearly how God revealed himself to this man, this prophet, at that time. Now, there's another thing that's very important. Here's the date. It was in February, five months before this date here, was when the Lord appeared to Haggai, And at that time, the work was begun on rebuilding the temple. And also, two months before this date, this man Haggai, you remember, delivered a very sharp message to the priests 
because they were impure. They were expecting God to bless them and also to the people because of their delay in building the temple, their hesitation in moving forward in that. Now, this man Haggai really delivered a message to them, but he also told them that there was coming the destruction of Gentile world power before God established his kingdom here upon this earth, and that the one who would rule would be the one that would be the Messiah, and he was coming from Zerubbabel. You remember that God says, I'll make him a signet on my hand, and that word signet is a mark of rulership. And so the Messiah is not only coming from David, he's coming from Zerubbabel. And both David and Zerubbabel are in both genealogies, the one in Matthew of Joseph, the one of Mary in Luke, the third chapter. Therefore, it was quite interesting that at this time, this having taken place, and the temple was still being built, this man Zechariah now is given ten visions. And that makes this rather important because it needs to be fitted in at the time that the temple was to be rebuilt. Now, as we have said, this is not a dream, but a vision that he saw, and I think he was wide awake. And my friend, if you have ten visions like this man had in one night, I don't think an aspirin tablet would put you to sleep or any of these pills that are advertised on TV today. I don't think they would help you at all. Wouldn't be any reason for taking it. Now, the first vision here is the riders under the myrtle trees. And that goes from verse 7 through 17. Now, will you notice this? He says to him in a most dramatic way here, he says, Behold a man, and this man is riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees that were at the bottom, and behind him were other red horses. And the red horses actually are sorrel. They are red horses, sorrel-colored, and white horses. And I think now we ought to stop and examine what the vision is all about. Now, to begin with, what about this man that is here, the red horse rider? Well, he was actually an angel in human form. Behold a man. This is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. Somebody says, how do you know that? Well, he's called in verse 9, And the angel who talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these things are. And then down in verse 11, they answered, The angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees. So that this one is the angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is the Lord Jesus Christ of the New Testament. And so here we see him standing among the myrtle trees, and let's just stop and look at those myrtle trees for just a few moments. This angel messenger now is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of the Lord, or the angel of the presence. In other words, Jehovah himself, the Messiah. And he's here in his pre-incarnate glory. Now, that shows him watching over this world. Now, it is true that Satan is called the prince of this world. And this world system, the carnality of this world today is all under Satan. But you see, God has not given up this earth. And this is one of the most comforting things here, this vision. Even at this very moment, standing yonder in the shadows... Is the Lord Jesus Christ keeping watch over his own. And here it's the nation Israel in particular. This is a tremendous vision, by the way. And what a comfort it is out of all these universes that are about us today and they cannot be numbered. 
for multitude, and they fill space. And when you say space, what in the world are you talking about? doesn't seem to be any end to it. It seems to be infinite today. Out of all this universe, the Creator, the God of this universe, is watching there in the shadows, keeping watch over His own. What a comfort and thought that is. What a message that is. And Zechariah will give many messages of comfort, and this is certainly one of them. Now, here's a red horse. And what is the significance of the red? Well, may I say that it speaks of blood, blood shed, speaks of blood shed in war in Revelation. But this one who is riding here, the red horse, it speaks of his blood shed. He's watching over this earth because he died and shed his blood for this earth that you and I live on. What a picture that we have here. And there was others there, though. There were other horses. And these other horses and horsemen were in the background. And the riders, I think, are implied, although nothing said here that would indicate that at all. We are told, and they stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him there were red horses. It doesn't say there were riders on them. I think we can rightly assume that there are riders on the horse. And I think that this means that here is a spot that God just hasn't given us all the information. I believe that these are angelic beings, and they are under His command, and it is their business to watch over this earth. And I think that these different colors that are given here are all significant. Again, the red horse, speaking of warfare, the sorrel horse, speckled in our translation. That means sorrel. And I hadn't even seen this word since I was a boy. But I lived in West Texas in southern Oklahoma, and horses were the means of transportation when I was a boy. I can remember when I saw my First automobile in Springer, Oklahoma. We stood and looked at it for two hours. Can you imagine going to a parking lot today and looking at a car that long? Well, we did in this little town in which I live. All of the population was out looking at it. A doctor was the one who owned the car. And it was fearful to behold, by the way, an unusual contraption. And no one ever thought that in the mud of that day that it would ever become successful. It would never supplant or take the place of the horse, but it sure did. Well, we talked about sorrel horses. A sorrel horse is a rather spotted horse, but generally more or less of a red color, a yellow color. In fact, I always thought of a sorrel horse as being a sort of a dirty yellow horse. Some folk may resent that, that have horses as pets, but That's the way they looked to me as a boy. Red horses, sorrel horses, and white horses. Now, the red horses would speak of warfare. The white horses, I think they speak here of victory. They speak of the fact that the one on that horse is marching to victory. I believe that there's significance in everything that you see here. Now, let's come to the myrtle tree and look at the myrtle tree for just a moment. The myrtle tree is what here in California they call the laurel tree. And you find it down in desert regions, down in the Palm Springs area. Here in Southern California, you see the myrtle trees. The Southern Pacific has planned them all along their track down there so the sand won't cover the track. You find them in the land of Israel. That's their native habitat, apparently. But Israel has set them out literally by the thousands. And they are considered sometimes the badge of Israel. You see, certain trees and plants represent the nation Israel. The olive tree that's native over there, the myrtle tree, the vine, the grapevine, all of these have been rather significant. And even the cedar. 
You find the other prophets talked about them. In Isaiah 41, 19, God says, I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive, and I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together. And God says again in Isaiah 55, 13, Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial for an everlasting sign which shall not be cut off. And that tremendous planting of trees over there, and most of them are myrtle trees, it could have real significance. And you find myrtle branches together with palm branches were used in the ritual of constructing booths and the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. And actually, Hadassah is the Jewish form of the name Esther. And Hadassah is the word for myrtle. So that when a girl is named Esther and another one named Myrtle, they actually have the same name. And it refers to the myrtle tree. Now, it says that it was at the bottom. What does it mean at the bottom? Well, it means down in a valley, down where the myrtle could probably get water, you see. And there was a grove down there. Now, there was this rider on the red horse. Back of him, apparently, riders on these other horses. And those that were sorrel or speckled, they apparently were standing under the shade of the myrtle trees, and the sun was filtering through. But these others, the red and the white, stand out rather clearly here. Now, he sees these myrtle trees down there in a valley. And even that, to me, is significant, for Israel certainly was down in the valley at this time. Now, what is the significance here? Well, I think the significance is that the Lord Jesus was just waiting, and he was waiting for the day to come when he's going to take over. And in this period, he's patrolling this earth. He is watching over it. And these other created intelligences that were there, they, of course, I assume are supernatural. They would be angels that would be there with him. This is a tremendous vision, by the way, that we have. And I want to read verse 9. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And that's the question we ask. So let's listen. And the angel who talked with me said unto me, I will show thee what these are. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro through the earth. You see, their job was patrolling. And they answered the angel of the Lord, the one on the red horse, that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We've walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still, and is at rest. Now, this sounds good, because this earth, in 5,000 years of recorded history, there have been only 200 years, a little bit better than 200 years, of recorded peace. Man is a fierce, warlike creature, and is war in his heart. But here is a period of peace, and it sounds good, but is it? Now, the message that was brought to the Lord Jesus by these that were the ones patrolling the earth, that there was peace in the earth. Now, we suggested that of 5,000 years of recorded history, that there's been a little over 200 years that there's been peace in the earth. That is, total peace in the earth. But this was one of those periods. Well, you'd say, well, now, that's wonderful. That is great. That peace has at last come to the earth. But what kind of peace was it? Well, it's the kind of peace that's not going to last very long. And why? Well, verse 12, "...then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah?" against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years. That is, for seventy years now, Jerusalem has been in rubble 
and ruin and in debris and in ashes. And now they have come back after the 70 years' captivity, and they're beginning to rebuild. And the cry here is, how long will it be before God is going to bring a real blessing? How long will it be? Well, God makes it clear here that he's displeased with the nations who are at peace and who ignore Jerusalem's plight. You see, he makes it clear here, and we'll note this now as I begin to read, God is jealous for Jerusalem. And the nations of the world are indifferent to her. God had returned to Jerusalem with mercies. And the nations have a responsibility also. But they were at peace. But they're not going to be at peace long. May I make this statement here? The world can never have permanent peace until the Lord Jesus is reigning in Jerusalem. He is the Prince of Peace, and the world can't have peace. And the peace that he offers today is peace with God because of sins forgiven, peace with your neighbor. And if you are right with God, you can have peace even among nations today. But the so-called civilized nations have been the ones in this century that have carried on two world wars, not Christian nations but civilized nations. And I had a little poem. I was going to pass it on to you today, but I couldn't put my hand on it. It was when we went into the South Pacific and fighting against Japan, and the soldier boys were amazed on many of the islands. They expected to find headhunters and cannibals and all that sort of thing, and they found little churches and Christians, and they were receiving them joyfully. And the poem goes on to say that the so-called heathen were at peace and the so-called Christian nations were at war. Well, that was the picture. The world can't have peace apart from Christ. Therefore, Jerusalem is the key to it. And the world was trying to have peace in that day and ignore Jerusalem. And it wasn't going to last long. You see, this was during the reign of Media Persia. Media Persia had put down the Babylonian Empire. Babylon, before that, had put down both Egypt and Assyria. So the Media Persian Empire was reigning now all the way from the Indus, all the way into the Mediterranean, and all the way from the snow of the mountains around the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea all the way down to the burning sands of the Sahara Desert. And they had brought, for a brief period of time, peace into the world. But it wouldn't be long till out of the West there would come Alexander the Great and had upset the apple cart again. Because, actually, Jerusalem was the key to it. Now will you notice, and I'm beginning reading now at verse 13, And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comforting words. Now, underscore those two adjectives. They were good words and they were comforting words. These are the words that are helpful. You see, Haggai pronounced judgment, but not Zechariah here. He's getting good words and he's getting comforting words. Now will you notice verse 14. So the angel that talked with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. Now, we've dealt with this word jealousy before. God is not jealous as we are today. It's not the human kind of jealousy that might lead to a shooting or might be just the flare-up of a bad temper. But the jealousy of God that is mentioned here is the kind of jealousy. In fact, God says, I'm jealous with a great jealousy. That is, I'm exceedingly jealous. You see, jealousy is a burning, fiery passion. And men have been jealous of that which 
is their own and what's dear to them. And when it falls into the hands of another and there's danger of it being taken away from them, believe me, they begin to move. Well, in this sense, may I say to you, God is likewise jealous. This was his city. These were his people. And he is fully aware here of the worldwide woe of oppressed Israel today. He's jealous for his people. And I believe that in time God is going to move on their behalf. And the world then and the world today is just ready to forsake them. Now, let me just keep on reading here. God says, "...and I am very much displeased with the nations that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction." In other words, these nations were doing nothing for this city. And God wanted it to be known that it was his city. Now he says in verse 16, "...therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies." Now God is saying to his people, I have come back, and in mercy I want to deal with my people. And as he's told us today, he's rich in mercy. And he says, "...my house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem." Now, there are those that believe that this line stretching forth upon Jerusalem speaks of the fact that there would be a great building boom and Jerusalem would expand and become a great city in that day. I think that's probably true. But every time God mentions the fact that a man with a measuring rod or a measuring line is going forth, we've seen this before, it simply means God is getting ready to move directly in that particular case. And here, now that the 70 years' captivity was over, God is turning to his people again and those that now have returned to him. And he's there rich with mercy. And he wants the nations and wants them to know they can never have peace unless there is peace in Jerusalem. That is the key to the peace that's here on this earth. And haven't the events of the past few years since they've become a nation again rather indicated that? And this little nation found out how few friends they really had in the world at the beginning of the oil crisis. They fell away like dead flies from them because they wanted nothing to do with them, because they wanted the oil more than they wanted the friendship of this nation. But, of course, this nation has not in any way returned to God uh, in spite of the fact that there's been this great building boom over there today. They've returned back to the land and they've been building the city. And Zionism is very much of a reality today. But they are still actually scattered throughout the world in unbelief. And they're still persecuted even at this moment, in this day in which we live, so that Friends, there's not peace on the earth, and there cannot be peace on the earth until there is peace in Jerusalem. And I'd like to dwell on this even more, but I cannot in this type of a study. We will be coming to other passages on Jerusalem in which we intend to develop this other line of thought which I think is very important today, that the significance and importance of Jerusalem as far as the history of the world is concerned. And you can check that back in history in the past, and it'll certainly be in the prophecy for the future. There's a great deal God has said concerning that. He said in Psalm 132, "...for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever." Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. That's verse 13. And he goes on to say in Psalm 78, verse 67, He rejected the tabernacle of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim, but he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. God says that's a spot that he loves. 
I must confess, I do not love Jerusalem. I just have to be very frank and confess that it's not to me an attractive place at all today. But God's going to make it that someday. The judgment of God is upon the place, I think, even in this day. Now, let me continue to read here. He says, verse 17, "...cry yet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem." Now, that looks down the future. So, these people can recognize that they are working in the plan and program of God that's going to extend down through the future. And what an application for Christians today. Are you and I working in something that has eternal value? What you're doing today, what value will it be ten years from today, a hundred years from today, a million years from today? Are we actually working in the light of eternity? And we should keep that in mind. Now we come here in verse 18 to the second vision. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel who talked with me, What are these? And he answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now, I take it that's one vision. But the next two verses about the four carpenters that are mentioned here, I consider that a separate vision, but it's generally put together by all the interpreters as one. I do not see it that way. Now, when he says here that he saw four horns, and these horns are the ones that scattered Jerusalem and scattered both Judah and Israel, the northern and southern kingdom. Now, a horn represents a Gentile ruler, and you find the little horn in the seventh chapter of Daniel, verse 24. And then when you go over to Revelation, and I think probably I should turn to that one, the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, and I want to look at that and read that one to you. It's verse 12, and it says, "...and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast." So that is for the future, you see. It looks to the future, but the horns represent a Gentile world power. And these four horns represent four Gentile world powers. Well, who are they? Well, the four that scattered Israel are Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, and Rome. All four of them scattered these people. Now, the very interesting thing is that God makes it very clear that these four horns are going to be dealt with. Now, notice verse 20, and we come now to the four carpenters, as they're called in our text today. Are They actually are trained workmen. And let me read verse 20 and 21. And the Lord showed me four artisans. And as I say... They are skilled workmen. They've generally been translated for carpenters. Or they can be called the four smiths. A smith is generally a trained workman. And this may explain the reason there's so many smiths in the world. Because you've got four to start with here, and that's a pretty good start. The Lord showed me four artisans, skilled workmen. Then said I, what come these to do. What are these skilled workmen doing here? And he spoke, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. And I think here's without doubt one of the most remarkable prophecies that we have in the Scripture. And frankly, I'm going to turn to the explanation that has been given by an, another one. Who are the four smiths here? Well, Jerome and Cyril and Calvin consider them supernatural means that God uses here, and they're symbolic of the supernatural means. Well, I don't quite 
agree to that. I think that what you have here now, the smiths or artisans that build up, and what you really have, and I'm greatly indebted to Dr. Merrill Unger for this interpretation. And by the way, I think he has the finest book on Zechariah that there is, at least that I have seen. You see what happened. The first horn was Babylon. Now, it was cast down by Media Persia, the second horn. But Media Persia now acts as an artisan. It tears down one nation but builds up another nation, the Media Persian. But in turn, the second horn, Media Persia, was destroyed by the third horn, which was the Greco-Macedonian Empire under Alexander the Great. But it, in turn, was destroyed by Rome, so that the smiths came along and they destroyed these. But the interesting thing, if you go back and study Rome, Rome was not destroyed by an outside power. In fact, Rome is to come back together again because it never did die. Rome just fell apart because of the internal corruption that was in that kingdom. It fell apart. Now there's coming one who will be Antichrist and put it back together again, and he'll be a world dictator. But who's going to put him down? Well, the coming of Christ to the earth. He'll be the fourth carpenter, if you please. He'll be the fourth smith. He'll be the one that will put down the Roman Empire when he comes at the end of the great tribulation period. I think this is one of the most wonderful prophetic passages that you have in the Word of God. And friends, I hope that this enables many of you to see how important it is to study all the Word of God in order to understand prophecy. No prophecy is given for any private interpretation. You don't interpret it by itself. It has to be fitted into God's tremendous program that reaches on into eternity. And until we see it that way, personally, I don't think you see it at all. Now, we discovered that Zacharias making something very clear. And I would like to state that so that you will see that it's given great prominence. In fact, it will be given great prominence in each one of these visions. And that is this, that God is not through with the nation Israel. That's one thing. And the second thing is that this cult today that tries to make Great Britain and the United States the ten lost tribes is just simply out because these prophecies make it clear that when God talks about Israel, he's talking about Israel and he's talking about people that are going to be in that land with Jerusalem, their capital, and Great Britain will have nothing in the world to do with it. To my judgment, it's been a sort of a salve to heal the hurt of a great many British folk and Americans today who are very proud of our ancestry, that we have a background that goes into the British Isles, and many of us do. But my friend, let's face up to it. Great Britain has become a third-rate nation, and we are at the top right now. Or maybe we're not at the top. I don't know. It looks very doubtful whether we are or not. And certainly we seem to be on the skids today going down. And so these prophecies sort of heal the hurt of all of this and helps our pride to believe that we might be the chosen people. Well, my friends, the only way God chooses people today is in Christ. And that doesn't make any difference who you are, what your color is, what your station in life. Race has nothing in the world to do with it. The important thing is that you and I are chosen in Christ and accepted in the Beloved. And unless we're in Christ, it wouldn't make any difference what nation we belong to, even the nation of Israel right now. That would not be helpful at all. But this does look down to the future when they are going to accept their Messiah. And it will be in that land, if you please. And Jerusalem means Jerusalem, and Israel means Israel. 
you can see again why I have put such a great emphasis on studying all of the Bible. You see, it's very easy to pull out a few little prophecies and twist the names that are given there and the meaning of them and come up with most any kind of interpretation. I'm of the opinion that you might be able to come up with the idea that it would be the Eskimos of Alaska if you twisted it around. But you can't take all the Bible and come up with anything other than God is not through with Israel, and Israel is the people that are anxious to go to that land. And one of the reasons that I know I'm not an Israelite by birth is I have no desire to go to the land of Israel, that is, to live. What is the old cliché today? A nice place to visit, but not a good place to live. That's my viewpoint of that land, and I have no ties that draw me to it whatsoever. I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. It's coming down from God out of heaven. That's our hope today. But these people have an earthly hope. Now we saw that these four horns, and I'll say this again rather briefly, the four horns represent four nations. Now I also recognize that there are those today that feel like the four horns could be something else. I believe they're the four Gentile world powers of Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, because These four great world empires that Daniel mentioned, all of them have dealt very severely with the nation Israel. In fact, they are the ones that have scattered them. But God judged each one in time, and at the time of the four horns, there appeared these artisans, these carpenters, these skilled workmen. And again, may I say that they represent the fact that When one of these nations scattered Israel, Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem, took them into captivity. Well, what happened? There came along Media Persia as the artisan or skilled workman and destroyed the Babylonian Empire. And the Media Persian came to the front. But after that, here comes another carpenter along, and that's Greece. Greece is actually represented in the book of Daniel by horn. So the four horns and the four carpenters are not identical, but there is this similarity. Three of them are the same. But when you get to Rome, who destroyed Rome? Rome just fell apart. Now there's coming an Antichrist who will put it back together and will become a world dictator. But who's going to put him down? Well, the Lord Jesus is coming, and he's the last of the carpenters here. I think that's interesting what he was here the first time. He did have that title, didn't he? The carpenter of Nazareth. And so he's coming someday again as a carpenter to put down this world dictator and establish his kingdom here upon this earth. And that kingdom will have as its center Jerusalem. And he will reign there. That is something that we need to keep before us. It has been put like this. Then let the world forbear their rage. The church renounce her fear. Israel must live through every age and be the Almighty's care. God will see to that. And he's not only going to be faithful to them, he's going to be faithful to the church also. And if you could persuade me that he's going to be unfaithful to the nation Israel, then I do not know what basis I could rest on him being faithful to the church today. But he is faithful and will be faithful. Now, there are those that think this could be that which is mentioned in Ezekiel, the 14th chapter, verse 21. And I want to read that. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four severe judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword and famine and the evil beast, and pestilence to cut off from it man and beast. And then there are those that compare it, and I do, the four horsemen of the apocalypse of Revelation that are going to ride in the last days. 
and they're going to ride through that land also as well as through the world, of course. Now we are coming today to the second chapter of Zechariah, and we have already seen the ten visions that are given. And of course, most expositors say eight visions, but we made a division in the first chapter between the four horns and the four skilled workmen. Our carpenters, as our translation has it, some call it artisans, they consider that one vision. I consider it two visions, and for that reason, why we call it ten visions. Now, that brings us to chapter 2, and this is the vision of the man with the measuring line. And let me read verse 1 of chapter 2, and this is the fourth vision. He says, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked. Now, I call your attention to this. He's not asleep. He sees this with his physical eyes, so he couldn't be asleep. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. Now, I want us to note what this really means, and I want to turn to other references we have of the measuring line. Over in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 38 and 39, I'd like to read those. He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner, and the measuring line shall yet go forth over against it upon the hill Garib, and shall compass about to go at. In other words, when you find God using a measuring line, it just simply means that he's getting ready to move again in behalf of that which he's measuring. Here it's the temple and Jerusalem. And we had Haggai with the temple. God was moving again. This man carried a measuring stick around with him, a yardstick. Now we have in the vision that he saw, here was this man. And I think that's very impressive to note that it's the man with the measuring line. Now I want to turn over to Ezekiel, another reference in the 40th chapter of Ezekiel, beginning with verse 2. I read, "...in the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel, and set me upon a very high mountain." by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold, with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee, for to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. Now that then is the vision. I'm not going to read any more, but if we did, we'd see it's a vision of the building of the millennial temple in Jerusalem. You see, God uses this. And then there's something else to keep in mind here. The appearance of this man reveals that he is the angel of the Lord. He is the pre-incarnate Christ. And he's revealed to us here in Zechariah as the man. And that is important for us to note, and we will note it later on. Now, one further reference relative to this measuring line. Over in Revelation, the 11th chapter, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading now. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. 
Now, we won't go into detail there other than to say that here is, again, the measuring of the temple, the millennial temple that is to be built, so that what we have before us, and it's becoming quite obvious when we move into chapter 2 here and see this vision that you have in prophecy given the rebuilding of the temple and the city in Zechariah's day. That is, the remnant is to return. But that does not in any way conclude the prophecy. Just as you have in Haggai looking down to the very end times, and that is true of all the other prophets, they see the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and that land during the millennium is to be restored, and the desert will blossom as the rose. And there's a whole lot of desert over there to blossom, my friend. And then the city of Jerusalem is to be rebuilt. And I think that when it's rebuilt and the Lord moves in there, that I'm going to like it. I don't like it today, but I think we'll all like it then. We're not going to live there. The new Jerusalem is where the church will be. Now, will you notice that he is describing in this chapter that we're entering, as he has before, not only the local fulfillment, but down through the ages, the fulfillment that will take place at the time of the millennium. Because Jerusalem is to be inhabited, and it will become the center of the earth. God makes it very clear that the Lord is going to do this. He's already said back in chapter 1, verse 17, "...my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord will yet have mercy upon Zion, and will yet choose Jerusalem." And so we're looking down now to the future, to that which is down there in the future, so that everything that they're doing now locally and in the immediate future has eternal significance, and that they are to understand God is not through with them at all. And this man with the measuring line here is none other than the angel of the Lord. It's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, a man whose name is the branch, as Zechariah will say later on. Well, that branch is the branch of David, the sprout that's coming from Jesse. That is the picture that's given to us here. Now, let me read verse 2. Then said I, where goest thou? In other words, Zechariah was interested, where in the world are you going with the measuring line? Then said I, where goest thou? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth of it and what is the length. Now, I think all of this has great significance. He's saying here that the city is to be expanded and it's to grow, and it certainly did in that day, and it certainly is today. It's spilled over the walls long ago. And on every hill around there, they are building today. But don't misunderstand me. I don't think that's the fulfillment of this prophecy. This is looking down to that which is yet future. Those people could still be driven out of that land and scattered again. And that would not disturb God's Word one bit, or the fact that He eventually and finally will bring them back to that land, for that is exactly what He intends to do. Now, we have here in verse 3, "...and behold, the angel who talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited like towns without walls, for the multitude of men and cattle in it." And, of course, the walls of Jerusalem today are just around, actually, the small Arab city, the old city. And most of the city is outside of the walls, as I've said, scattered on all the hills. And that will be true in that day. But it won't be needful to have walls because, number one, with modern warfare, they wouldn't afford any kind of protection at all. And number two, they will be dwelling in peace in that day. And that means that the Prince of Peace will be reigning in Jerusalem. Now he says in verse 5, 
For I, saith the Lord, will be unto it a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of it. Now, that certainly is not true today. It's American planes and American help that's been the protection to that land. But God says he'll be a wall of fire around them in the future. What does that mean? That means God will protect them. And my friend, when God protects them, that's going to be miraculous. Now, God says that I'll not only be the protection around the city, but God says that I also intend to be in your midst. In other words, the Shekinah glory would be back in the temple. And that certainly was not fulfilled in that day in any way at all. It's the same thing he's saying here that God said to Abraham after he had delivered Lot. God says, I am thy shield. I'm your protection. I think that Abraham was frightened in the battle because I think that his life was in danger. And he says, I'm thy shield. God said, I'll protect you. And I'm thy exceeding great reward. Now, that simply means God will make good all that he's promised. And so he's saying that to the city, I'm going to be the glory in the midst of you. And that is when the Lord Jesus comes and enters the millennial temple. Now, that picture has been given to us in another apocalypse in Ezekiel. Remember we said that Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah and Revelation are four apocalypses in the Bible. And they all look down to the future when the kingdom is to be established here upon the earth. And we have here Ezekiel. And I'm going to quote here an extended section because I think this is rather important. It's from the 43rd chapter of Ezekiel. Now, here's the glory that is coming What did he mean by it? Well, listen to this. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters. This is the coming of the Lord Jesus. This is the coming of the Messiah into the temple. And he's coming from the east. And that's the reason that That eastern gate is so prominent today, though sealed up, and all of the graves that are there. My, there are many Muslim graves too, by the way. But all thousands of Israelites are buried there in the Kidron Valley on both sides, up on the side of the Mount of Olives there. And why? Because this is going to be fulfilled someday. And his voice was like the noise of many waters, And the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision I saw by the river Kibar. And I fell upon my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me, and he said unto me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Now, that's a long time, forever. You see, this is not a prophecy in Zechariah or Ezekiel that finds its fulfillment and its interpretation in a local happening. It looks down through the ages to the millennium, to the time the Lord Jesus will come and establish his kingdom. And he says, "...and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile." Now, that's Ezekiel 43, 1 through 7. Now, here, briefly, he says, "...for I, saith the Lord, will be unto it a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of it." Now, that's verse 5. Now, verse 6. "...ho, ho, 
Well, we saw that last time, and actually what that literally is doing is calling particular attention to the fact that he wants them to pay particular attention. In other words, one hole would be enough. But when you got a double hole, it's to arrest their attention. And he's giving something that's very important here. And it's a warning at this place because he says, "...come forth and flee from the land of the north." Now, that means get out of Babylon. Why? Babylon was going to fall. God was going to bring it down. In other words, let me revert back to the two visions of about the horns and about the carpenters. That first horn is Babylon. And now the carpenters come in and go and take it down. And that'll be Media Persia. But Media Persia will become a great power, a horn. And then they will persecute God's people. And then God will move them off the scene by bringing in another carpenter. And that carpenter will be Greece. And then Greece will be a proud nation. And believe me, under a ruler that came out of the division of the empire of Alexander the Great, there came uh, Titus Epiphanes, uh, how he persecuted these people. And then God raised up another carpenter, and he came and cut down this power, and he became a world power. That was Rome. Now, where's the carpenter to cut down Rome? Rome fell apart, but it's going to come back together again. Who will put it down? Well, the Lord Jesus is going to come from heaven. He's the carpenter Nazareth, remember? And he is the man with the measuring rod, and he'll put down the Antichrist and his kingdom, and will establish his kingdom here upon the earth. Now, that's the picture that's given to us here in these visions. They are of utmost significance, as you can see. Now, let me move on here. He says, Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heaven, saith the Lord. In other words, God says, actually, come back to the land, but I'm going to spread you throughout the four winds, that is, to the four corners of the earth. And that's exactly what he did after that. Verse 7, "...deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon." In other words, get out of Babylon. "...for thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoil you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye." Now, that is an unusual expression. It occurs, I think, a couple of other times in the Scripture. And it refers to these people that touches you, the apple of his eye. Well, what's the apple of an eye? Well, an apple, I think, actually, is an orange in that land. They didn't grow apples there. They did grow oranges. And an orange is a very attractive sort of fruit. On a tree, an orange stands out in the green leaves. It's just like a sore thumb stands out. Oh, it's much prettier than a sore thumb. But it really is out where you can see it. And God says, you are just that prominent and important to me. Now, don't tell me that God's going to be blind to the apple of his eye. He just simply is not going to be. Verse 9, "...for behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be spoiled to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me." In other words, these people were going to get an assurance that God had sent this young man, Zechariah. Now, will you notice verse 10? And he says, "...sing and rejoice." O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Now, here is one of the great prophecies, friends, of Scripture. One of the great prophecies of Scripture. Now, with this verse, how can anyone say that God is through with these people, with the nation Israel? How can anyone say that, and how can anyone 
just up and appropriate what God is saying to these people, O daughter of Zion. Well, Zion is a mountain over in that land. England doesn't even have a mountain at all. There's none there. And how would you relate it to the United States? We have plenty of mountains. Now, I know that there are several places in this country called Zion. The only problem with that is God never called them Zion. But he did call Zion and Israel Zion. And when he says Zion, I don't think he's talking about Illinois or Utah or any other place. He's talking about that land over there. There is a danger, and I would call attention to that here, of taking these prophecies that were given to this nation and relate them to us today by way of interpretation. Now, you can by application because there are great principles stated here. But when God is talking about geography, he means that. Now, somebody says, but this is a vision. Granted, but a vision is a vision of reality. A friend of mine tried to explain away the book of Revelation. He disagreed with my interpretation, and he came and he said to me, it doesn't mean that. I said, then you tell me what it means. He says, it's a symbol. I says, it is? All right, now I said, you tell me what it is a symbol of. Oh, he says, just a symbol. I says, don't you know that a symbol has to be a symbol of something? And it has to make sense? You can't just pull out of the air like a magician your own understanding. You can't reach down in a high hat and pull out a rabbit and say, well, this is what it means. How do you know what it means? It's a symbol of something. And you're to determine then what it is if you think it is. But when God uses a geographical term like Zion, he's talking about Zion. And he's talking about O daughter of Zion. Now, the daughter of Zion would be the nation Israel. That is a very familiar figure for them. And it can't mean any other people. And it does mean those people. Now, may I say this? It does not mean the church, and it does not mean Great Britain or the United States. Zion means Zion. No, it's amazing if you just let the Bible say what it wants to say. You know, the Scripture's being poured through some very peculiar funnels, if you ask me. And, of course, I know some people think this is a peculiar funnel that you're listening to right now. But test it by the Word of God. That's the only way you can do. No prophecy is of any private interpretation. You have to put it alongside others, and it must make sense. If it doesn't make sense, then it's certainly not the Word of God that you're giving. All right. Notice this. He says, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Now, that means exactly what it says, that God intends to come to Zion. And that's a geographical spot on the earth, and a certain group of people will be there. And actually, I don't think it'll be Arab. It'll just happen to be those that are the daughters of Zion. That's the nation Israel. And I don't believe that it can be twisted, distorted, and made to mean something else. Because I don't believe that it means something else in any way whatsoever. Now, if you'd refer to the second chapter of Isaiah, you'd find out that it parallels this passage of Scripture. And let me read, therefore, verse 11. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Now, not only Israel, but many nations. And they shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. They certainly don't know that today, but they will know it in that day. And the Lord shall inherit Judah as his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Now, this ought to answer once and for all the question. The Lord shall inherit Judah. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about Judah. Now, those today that have a bitter and acrimonious anti-Semitism in their hearts, 
and always liked to say Judah refers to Jews and that Israel is something else. Did you notice what God said in this passage of Scripture here? And the Lord shall inherit Judah. That ought to be the answer to the anti-Semite. God says he intends to inherit Judah. Now, Judah is Judah. (laughs) And as his portion in the Holy Land. And by the way, this is the only place in the Bible where the term Holy Land is used. Now, it's not the Holy Land today. I have made that statement on radio. I've made it in giving many messages around over the country, and generally it's challenged. Somebody says, well, that is the Holy Land. That's where Jesus walked. May I say to you, friends, his footprints are all gone. They're not there anymore, and he's not walking there right now. He will someday, and when he does, it'll be the Holy Land. But it's not the Holy Land today. It's anything but holy. And in the Holy Land, and he shall choose Jerusalem again, which means he's not choosing it right now. And i go along with that. I wouldn't choose it either right now. But when he chooses, it's going to become the capital of this earth. Now, again, may I say that if you can't put Scriptures down for the side of this, then I think that you're in trouble. Now, you go over to the second chapter of Isaiah and listen to this. Verse 2, Isaiah 2, "...it shall come to pass in the last days..." Now, we're moved out to the last days. "...that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we shall walk in his paths." For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, friends, that's looking forward to the millennium. God is not through with these people. Many nations will be chosen at that time. Now, will you listen to him? The Lord shall inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and shall choose Jerusalem again. Now, verse 13, the last verse in this chapter. Be silent. O all flesh before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. In that day, the whole earth will keep silent. Won't that be wonderful? We talk about freedom of speech, and there's going to be a marvelous freedom of silence in that day. Won't hear a thing. Why? Because God is in his holy temple. That looks forward, friends, to the millennium that's coming on this earth someday. Now, with that prospect for the future, that ought to be an encouragement to these people in Zechariah's day, which it was. It ought to be an encouragement to us today that God has a plan and purpose for each one of us. And he's working in your life and my life. Don't fear God. He's working in your heart, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Oh, to be in step with him today. To be going the same direction he's going.